So first of all, hi. I'm glad to see so many of you here from last semester. I tried very, 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 very hard to help you pass. Um, OK, another update is I have gotten shorter because there's no stage. So now I am closer to you, my students. I think the first week is the most important week. The first week is when I tell you what we're going to do in this class. I tell you what to focus on. I explain how to calculate your grade. I show you where all of the materials that you need can be found. And hopefully I will be able to explain to you what kind of mindset, what kind of thinking would be helpful for you. So let's begin with the basics. Course website, it looks very similar to last semester with a few uh, small changes. Um, so this semester, because you guys voted last semester, we are not doing a midterm group presentation. We're doing a midterm exam. So here is where I will input your midterm exam, final exam and attendance grades. You can't see this. I have hidden it from you. This will be our main reference textbook. Uh, so if you need to review some ideas or look up some details, that's the book we're going to use for the last, let's say three weeks. We're going to use this book. Um, this is actually a writing textbook. Um, when we get to near the end of the semester, we will hopefully have transcended grammar and we are going to enter into style how to write uh, an English sentence with clarity, coherence in a way that people can understand you. So for the last few weeks, we're going to use this textbook, especially questions from uh, practice questions from that textbook. Uh, once again, reminding you because I am lecturing in English, I will be recording every lecture and uploading it to YouTube because on YouTube you can open a searchable transcript. Uh, and this video shows you how to use that. So if you need to review one part of the class, you don't have to watch the whole video. You can use the transcript and jump to the part that you want to watch again. OK, so last semester this section was filled with other stuff. I decided to move all of that other stuff into this folder. So if you want more materials, if you want more guidance, if you want another textbook, uh, everything is in this folder, extra materials. OK, we're doing this unit introduction this week. Uh, and then the first half will cover the midterm exam. The second half will cover the final exam. Um, these are two halves of the whole big handout. As you can see, there's a stack of handouts in front. That is the first handout. I will pass that out later. Um, and then last semester, we, I called this bonus. This semester, I'm calling it extra credit. And there are two kinds. If you think you're going to fail the course, do the first one. If you think you're going to pass the course and you just want a higher grade, then do the second harder one. Uh, and just a reminder, if you have already done this before, tell me and I will give you a new text. If you repeat the same text, it will not count. Um, so both of these have a deadline. This is week 19 to week 20. I think this is Wednesday to Wednesday, week, week 18 to week 19. So um, I'm hoping that you will try your best 
um, to do well in the regular course and only at the last moment after you have handed in your final exam and you have calculated your grade and you really think you don't have a chance, then you can come take a look at this. So it's and I'm not going to tell you what this is. I want to keep it a surprise. OK, so that is the Moodle website. Every week's lecture will be uploaded under the respective unit, just like last semester. Do you have questions about this? OK, so let's take a look at what we're doing this semester. Last semester was focused on elements inside of a sentence, right? Parts of speech, uh, punctuation, that kind of thing. This semester is focused on everything above the sentence level. So is it a complete sentence? How do you combine sentences? How do you write different types of sentences? So we're going to begin maybe this week, maybe next week, we're going to begin with subordinate clauses. Then we're going to quickly move into participial constructions, questions, negation, quotations, and uh, noun clauses, and then we'll hit the midterm exam on week 10. Then we're going to do uh, relative pronouns, relative adverbs, coordinating conjunctions, conjunctive adverbs, and starting week 15, we're going to put everything together and we're going to do complex sentences and just lots of extra practice. And then week 18, or week 17 is a movie because I don't know what else to do, and week 18 will be the final exam. You probably don't know what I'm talking about, but you will find out very soon. Uh, so here I also gave you um, some learning guidance. English grammar is like a puzzle. There are limits to what kinds of words you can add after each word. Learn to think according to form, not just content. Uh, I'll talk about this later, but the basic idea is not just what does it say, but how does it say it? Uh, and then this semester, the grading percentages, the midterm exam will be 40%. The final exam will be 20%, and then attendance again will be 40%. Um, this is flipped around from last semester, right? Last semester, the midterm presentation was 20, and the final exam was 40. My thinking is that the midterm exam will cover less material, so it should be a little bit easier. Right? Hopefully, hopefully the midterm will be a little bit easier. I actually don't know how I'm going to uh, do the exams yet. I have a few ideas I haven't decided yet. So, when you receive your midterm grade and after you calculate your attendance, you can probably guess whether you're going to pass or not. Uh, attendance is a total of 40%, right? So a total of 40 points. Each week that you are absent for no reason and you did not take leave, I will take away six points from 40. Uh, if you use 100%, attendance is 100%, each week you are absent without reason and without leave, I will take away 15 points. Um, so that way you can calculate your own score. Uh, if you are sick, take leave. If you have something you have to do, take personal leave. Uh, if you are a biological woman and you don't feel well, that also is fine. But if you don't have a reason, I will take points away. OK, questions? OK, so that's what we're doing this week. Now it says today I'm going to introduce the course and then we're going to look at the final exam from last semester. 
OK, I think I finished introducing the course. Let's look at the final exam. This thing. Uh, I'm sure some of you had nightmares about this. So let's take a look. The thing about this kind of exam, it's testing you on two skills. One, do you know the correct grammatical form, right? And two, can you see the mistakes? So one is practical grammar skills, but the other one is your skill of observation. You can have perfect grammar, but it will be no use if you can't see where you need to use it. OK, so let's go line by line, right? One mistake per line. Oh, and uh, one student did not circle the mistake. So that student, the highest possible score was 20 out of 40. Remember to circle the mistake. OK, line one. I was stunned that he's speaking to me. He was sitting as far away from me as the desk allowed, which where's the mistake? I was stunned. And he was sitting, therefore this should also be was. Line two. So, so like I'm pointing them out, right? Once I tell you this is wrong, I'm sure many of you can see you're right. That is wrong. Why didn't I see it? So your grammar, your practical grammar skills are OK, but your observation skills need to be improved. Line two, but his chair was angled toward me. His hair was dripped wet and disheveled. Even so he. Do you see the mistake? Here. What is the subject of OK, so the verb drip. Right, it means that water is falling from something to somewhere. So if the subject is hair. Is it actively dripping or is it passively being dripped on? This should be active, right? It should be dripping. Dripping wet. Disheveled just means messy. Line three looked like he just finished shooting a commercial to hair gel. His dazzling face was friendly. Do you see the mistake? Actually, a lot of you saw the mistake. But fewer people knew how to correct it. It's obviously not a commercial to hair gel. Hair gel is the thing you use on your hair to make it stay in place. It's a commercial for hair gel. The commercial is trying to sell hair gel. Line four. And open with a slight smile on his flawless lips, but his eyes was careful. Where's the mistake? Here. How many eyes? Two eyes, so this should be were. Were careful. Number five, my name is Edward Cullen. Sorry, my name is Edward Cullen, he said. I didn't have a chance to introduce myself last week. Where's the mistake? This one is pure observation. If you see it, you know. If you didn't see it, uh, you're screwed here. This should be a double quotation mark. Right now, it's a single quotation mark. You need two, a double quotation mark. Number six, you need be Bella Swan. It's a short line, right? There are four words and two punctuation marks and I already gave you a question about the punctuation so it it's probably one of the words you have a 25% chance 
where's the mistake? You must be. If I say you need be, first of all, it doesn't make sense, right? It should be uh, you need to be. But need to means have to. Like if you're not Bella Swan, then something is very wrong. But here, Ed Edward is saying it is very likely that you are Bella Swan. So you must be tweeting your chief. Line seven. My mind was spinning with confusion. Had I made up the whole thing? He was perfect polite. I. Where's the mistake? Adjective plus adjective is not correct. It's perfectly polite. Adverb plus adjective. Line eight, I had to speak, he was waiting, but I couldn't think of anything conventional to say. Do you see the mistake? Sorry, it's another punctuation mistake. This has to be changed somehow. Uh, we're going to talk about this a lot this semester because it's also related to sentence structure. But two complete English sentences cannot be connected using only one comma. There are many other choices. You can change this to a semicolon, fen hao. You can change this into two different sentences. You can use an M dash. But you cannot use one comma only. Line nine. How do you know my name? I managed to ask. OK, Microsoft Word already tells you the answer right here. You only need one past tense managed. And after two, you can only add a verb. In its root form, base form. To ask. And line 10, he let out the soft and enchanting laugh. Do you see the mistake? Here. Have we have we heard Edward laugh before? No, right? It's something new. So this should be a a soft and enchanting laugh. So as you can see, last semester's exam was focused on individual words, individual aspects. But this semester we're doing whole sentences. So how should I do the exams? I have I have two ideas and we can talk about this together. You can try to change my mind. So one idea is. I will I could give you. 20 sentences, a paragraph of 20 sentences. And you have to produce a paragraph with only 10 sentences. That means the exact same thing. Uh, and I will simply look at whether your answer is grammatically correct or not. Or I can give you a paragraph with 10 complete sentences, but no punctuation and no capital letters. And you have to turn it into a correct paragraph without changing any words. Which one do you want? Um, you can tell me after class because I'm still trying to decide also. But it will be one of those two. And so now you know what kind of skills you need to focus on to prepare for the exams. Whether you can tell a sentence is a complete sentence, and whether you can combine sentences correctly. These two skills. 
Well, you also have to tell if it's not a complete sentence, how do you make it into a complete sentence? OK, do you have questions about the exam? All right. So let's get into this semester. Sentence structure of English. Uh, I mentioned previously that to learn grammar well, you have to be able to think in terms of form. So, OK, let's see if I can find this. It's not here, OK. OK, why did I search for that? I just need the sentence. Green ideas sleep furiously. What does this mean? I don't know, but the second question is, is this a grammatically correct sentence? These are two different ideas. You can know what a sentence means even if it's not correct. You can also know whether a completely meaningless sentence is correct or not. The second idea is what you should focus on. Is this sentence grammatically correct? So let's look at this. A complete English sentence usually has a subject and a verb. Does this sentence have a subject? It does, right? Ideas is the subject. Does this sentence have a verb? Also, yes, sleep. What does it mean for ideas to sleep? Don't know, but it's a subject and it's a verb, so it's correct. Now, ideas. Can this noun be modified using adjectives? Yes, it can. Good ideas, bad ideas new ideas, you can add adjectives. So you can also say colorless green ideas. These are both adjectives. And can you use an adverb to describe, uh, to modify the verb sleep? Yes, you can. I slept well, I slept poorly, I slept intermittently, which means now and then, not continuously. So you can, you can add an adverb to describe how you sleep. So in terms of grammar, when you see this sentence, I hope you can also see adjective, adjective, noun, verb, adverb, and you can tell that this is grammatically correct. This is, in, this is probably the most important skill in terms of grammar, learning grammar, but also using grammar. When we use language in real life, people usually don't care about grammar until something goes wrong. But when things do go wrong, there are two ways to try to make sense of what's happening. You can try to guess the words, or you can try to guess the grammar. If you don't know the words, then you have to use the grammar. Uh, and I'm talking from my own experience teaching you guys literature. When I say you guys, I mean Ming Chuan students. Um, next semester in uh, Introduction to British Literature, we will read some older stuff, right? Shakespeare, that kind of thing, where the words can be very different, very uncommon today but the grammar will be the same so if you don't know a word and you don't want to check the dictionary every single time the only way you can use to guess the meaning of the word is to use the grammar um, also in my experience uh, advising graduation theses all of you have to write one Right before you graduate, you have to write um, at least 30 pages of research in English. 
Uh, in my experience, a lot of the times students struggle with reading the research and writing about it because of grammar. Somebody writes something in a research paper and uh, you can recognize every word, but you have a hard time putting the words together. How do you put words together? That is the question of grammar. So for example, this poem is taken from Alice in Wonderland. Uh, it's full of nonsense words, so it's not. There's no definitive meaning behind this poem, but you should be able to tell what part of speech each of these nonsense words is. For example, slithy. Is this a noun, verb, adjective, or adverb? You should be able to tell. Uh, let's start here. The, the can only come before a noun or an adjective, right? So these two words, one of these has to be a noun because the next word is a verb. In English, usually adjectives come before nouns, so it's likely that toves is the noun and slightly, therefore, is an adjective. Same here. Is gimbal a noun, verb, adjective, or adverb? We look at the sentence. In is a kind of location. So really we're looking between did and in. Did tells us that this is an, an action, but it's a verb, but did itself does not carry any content, does not have actual meaning. Did here tells us that these two are both verbs. These are two actions, gyre and gimbal in the wabi. Again, what kind of action? No idea, but you should be able to say to see that these are verbs. So Adjective, adjective, verb, article, noun, plural, conjunction. What is the again? I can't, article, yes. Adjective, noun, verb. This is what it means to pay attention to form, not just to content. If you have this idea of sentence structure, then when you run into a sentence that you understand 95%, but there are just two words you don't know, then you can use the grammar to help you guess the meaning of the words that you don't know. For example, okay, here, th this sentence. Beware the jabberwock, my son. Okay, so there is only one word you don't know. Right? Beware means be careful of. Jabberwock, is that a noun, verb, adjective, or adverb? It's a noun, good, because the word the comes before it and because it serves as the object of the sentence. The speaker is telling the young boy, my son, to be careful of this thing. So it's a noun. Good, how about this? A sentence with two words that you don't know. The frumious bandersnatch. Is, what, okay, what part of speech is frumious? Noun, verb, adjective, adverb. The can only come before a noun or an adjective. There are only two words left in the sentence. Therefore, this is probably a noun. And if Bandersnatch is a noun, then Frumius is an adjective. 
So please try to keep this idea in mind using sentence structure to help you understand the, the grammar of a sentence and using the grammar of a sentence to help you understand the meaning. So um, during this course, I will emphasize again and again the idea of a complete sentence. What exactly is a complete sentence? Um, I, I'm using these two files, right? OK, so here. The children will stop at the corner. Is a complete sentence because it has a subject cluster. Here using the symbol MP. It has a verb cluster. Here using the symbol T prime. And it has the other information at the end of the sentence here using the symbol PP. So in fact, you can see from the structure that in English there is a very important separation between subject and object. Right, everything to the left of TP is the subject. Everything to the right of TP, we call this the predicate. Predicate means a description. So what is the subject doing? What is uh, important about the subject? All of that comes on the right side of TP. Now, some not every sentence will be in this order. So how can you check whether a sentence is correct and complete or not? Uh, well, there are I believe here we have three tests. First is the substitution test. If you can replace one part of the sentence with a. Um, not exactly a pronoun, but a substitute and it still makes sense, then it's complete. For example, in this sentence, uh, the children will stop at the corner. If you can replace the children with they. You can replace stop at the corner or stop with do and at the corner with so. So the children will stop at the corner. They always do so. If you can replace it cleanly like this, that means that the original sentence is a complete sentence. You can also replace a location with there. The children stopped there. So if you do these replacements and the sentence still has leftover ideas, then it is not a complete sentence. The second test you can try is the movement test. Can you move um, everything after the verb, this part, to another place in the sentence? So for example, they stopped at the corner. You can move this to the front at the corner, comma, they stopped. If you can move it cleanly, then it is a complete sentence. But using this structure, you have to move this whole part. You can't just move like the corner. Right, you can't move at the. Uh, you can't say right, you can't say at the they stopped corner. That doesn't make sense. Um, so a movement test can also help you determine whether your sentence is complete. Finally, you can use a coordination test. Can you add something new to the sentence along the same structure? So the original sentence, the children will stop at the corner. Stop is a verb and then at the corner is the location. Can you add something similar and look is the verb and both ways describes how uh, the children will look. Right, these two parts have a similar sentence structure. Uh, we say that they are coordinated. So if you can, if you have a longer sentence and you can find which parts match and are coordinated with which other parts and everything fits, then it is a complete sentence. As I said earlier,
English grammar is like a puzzle. So like a regular puzzle, some pieces will fit, some pieces will not fit. Um, so if something is grammatically correct, that means that you have chosen the correct piece and you have turned it in the right direction and you have put it in the right place. OK, do you have questions about this idea of a complete sentence? So this is two pages from my favorite linguistics textbook. Next semester, you're going to take Introduction to Linguistics. Uh, linguistics is the study of language. Linguistics is one of the few courses in an English department that is a science. Like literature, writing, those are so-called soft skills, but linguistics is a hard science. You will be uh, using things like uh, binary determinations, different kinds of tests. Uh, you will be learning phonetic systems, very exciting stuff. But one thing you will not be learning is sentence structure, also known as syntax. I, I checked, right? OK, so next semester in linguistics, you're going to learn phonetics, which is the study of possible human sounds. You're going to learn phonology, which is the study of. How sounds make meaning. Like we can make many different kinds of sounds, but a lot of them will not have meaning. So how does a language determine what sounds are meaningful? That's phonology. Then you're going to learn morphology, which is the structure of words. And apparently if uh, your linguistics teacher will have enough time, uh, he will also say something about syntax and then the semester will be over. Now, our department does offer linguistics two as an elective, Xuanxiu, but I checked. In linguistics two, you will be learning about semantics. How do you tell the meaning of a sentence? You will learn about pragmatics. What's the difference between the meaning of a sentence and what uh, and how somebody responds to that sentence? You will learn about uh, neurolinguistics. How does the brain understand language? You will learn about uh, language acquisition. How do you learn language? If you take the course, but you will not learn about syntax. And I think I thought this was very strange. Usually uh, we consider the first five units or first six units to be the core of linguistics, phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, and semantics, five units. But our department does not teach you syntax. Why? Why do we not teach you this basic unit? And then it hit me. Oh, I'm teaching syntax. Sentence structure of English. Syntax. So yes, uh, English is only one language. We're not going to talk about uh, American Indian languages or Spanish or like Eskimo language. But we can still learn about syntax using English. So on Moodle, I have scanned the entire syntax chapter from my favorite linguistics textbook. It's. It's only 44 pages. Uh, but it also includes practice questions, so it's only like 35 pages. Now next week is February 28. No class. This means I can give you two weeks worth of homework. And I have decided to make you read this chapter. So um, before next time we meet in class, Please read as much as you can of the syntax chapter and I will. I'll give you a quiz. Yeah, I'll give you a quiz on this chapter. Uh, and hopefully by reading some of the basic ideas of syntax, it will help you prepare to learn about the details of English syntax. OK. 
OK, um, wow, that was fast. I'm very glad I brought the handouts. Um, so I'll pass out the handouts now. And then in the second hour, I will guide you through the beginning of the syntax chapter. OK, and uh, I should say for the benefit of some of you who were not here last semester, the way I teach grammar is using editing tasks, just like the final exam that we just saw. Um, every week I will explain the concepts of the unit and then we will do practice questions. So the handout is 100% practice questions. These practice questions all ask you to find a mistake and to correct it. So the same logic as the exam. Uh, and the questions that we do not finish together in class, I will ask you to finish at home as homework. And the following week, we will compare answers for the homework, and then I will introduce the next unit, so on and so forth, on until e eternity and until we all die. So. Uh, that's how this course goes. Now, um, I have been thinking about whether to be a little bit stricter. Here's the thing. I don't like forcing students to do things, as you can probably tell. I feel like if I force you to do something you don't want to do, that does not mean you will actually learn what I want you to learn. It just means you will suffer more. Right, so um, I don't take attendance by calling your name. Uh, I don't grade these handout questions. Instead, I try to encourage you to see the importance and the benefit of working hard to learn grammar. I try to give you value when you come to class, something that you probably cannot get anywhere else even if you just go home and watch the recording. I do believe these things. However, last semester's final exam scores were kind of low. And by kind of, I mean uh, most of you did not pass. So I've been having this big debate in my mind. When we do these practice questions in class, last semester I would just give you five minutes, 10 minutes, and then we would talk about the answers. Should I instead call you by name to share your answer? If I do that, would you 
have an incentive to better understand what you're doing? Studies show that if, if teachers do this, students don't actually learn better. They are just more terrified. Um, a, a study was done in uh, Harvard Law School. Harvard Law School loves to do this, right? The teacher will throw a question out and then look at the names and pick somebody. Uh, but studies have shown that students, uh, instead of thinking about the question, they'll sit there scared like a mouse unless their teacher calls them. And if their teacher calls them, then they try to give the answer. And after that, they relax and they still don't learn. And if the teacher doesn't call them, they're too busy being scared to learn anything. But you guys aren't that easily scared, right? You guys are brave college students. We'll see, we'll see in two weeks. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the syntax chapter. The analysis of sentence structure. By the way, this is not the textbook you will be using next semester. This is my favorite textbook, not your linguistics professor's favorite textbook. Um, so as it says, syntax is the component of grammar that is concerned with the form of grammatical sentences. Um, and the, the theory that this chapter uses is called generative grammar. And the idea is that if you know the rules. And the operations of those rules, so if you know the rules and you know what you can do with those rules, you will be able to. Understand all the different ways that a sentence can make sense, uh, can be correct, not make sense, can be correct. Uh, this is just one theory of linguistics, but it's a very popular theory. And the way that syntax, uh, the study of syntax um, shows the structure of a sentence is by using these diagrams. These are called uh, a tree diagram. Um, when I was in college, we all hated drawing these things, but you won't have to draw them. You only have to understand them. Um, and let's see, categories of words. We, we talked about this last semester. We can skip that. Um, but this idea is important. Uh, the same word can have different categories, right? Uh, in Chinese, we call this ping. In English, it's not as strict, very fluid. So like a comb as a noun is the tool that you use to fix your hair. As a verb, it is the action of fixing your hair. Uh, near, as a preposition, is describing degree of distance. As a verb, it can mean approach, become near to. And you can use it as an adjective, the car that is near. So how, when we see a word in a sentence, how do we know what part of speech it is? Um, I already gave you the answer. You look at the sentence structure. Um, but you can also look at the structure of the word, right? If it ends with an S and it means more than one, it can only be a noun. If it ends in ED, it can only be a verb or a verb used as an adjective, that kind of thing. Um, or you can use the idea of distribution. Some words can only go with other kinds of words. So like a noun always uh, a noun can have a determiner, a car, the wheat. If you see a determiner, if you see an article, the next word is probably a noun or an adjective. It won't be a verb. It won't be an adverb. So when you learn new words, you can also pay attention to how these words go together. The grammar that determines what goes with what. Let's take a short break. Where's the signing sheet?
Okay, let's continue. So we were just talking about how uh, in an English sentence, words can only fit with other specific kinds of words. Right, so if it's a noun, only a noun can take a an article, only a verb can take an auxiliary, uh, and only a ver an adjective or verb can take an adverb. And there are also specific limitations according to the specific word. Right, so here we have examples that don't work. Destruction is a noun, so you cannot say will destruction. You have to say will destroy. Destroy is a verb. You can't say the destroy. You have to say the destruction. Arrive is a verb, but very cannot describe a verb. Um, so this has to be an adjective in order to use the word very. These are the kinds of things that you can pay attention to as you read and as you write to improve your grammar sense. OK, so those are on the level of words. Now we get into this thing. Um, so when you put words together, it's not just a straight line. There are hierarchical levels. Some words are higher than others. So um, the main word of a section, we call a section a phrase. Phrase. So XP, this is the phrase level. This is the bar level, right? X prime is called X bar. So every phrase will have a specifier and a bar, and a bar will have a head and a complement. So for example, let's see what do we have here? A map of Canada. The map is the head. This is the most important part. The complement of Canada helps you understand the head. And the specifier limits the possibilities of the phrase. So a map, what kind of map? A map of Canada. Uh, and you know that it is a map you have not mentioned before because it says a map, not the map, not my map. It's a random map of Canada. Why Canada? Because this textbook was written in Canada. Uh, so this would be a noun phrase, right? The head is a noun. For a verb phrase, the head is a verb. The main idea of this phrase to protect. What do we protect? The environment. Uh, and is there any limitation on this action? Yes, there is. Always protect, not sometimes protect, not never protect. It's limited to always. Or an adjective phrase. The main head, the main idea is an adjective, fond, which means like or like enjoy. Fond of what? What do you enjoy? Fond of wine. So you enjoy wine. Is there a limitation? Yes, there is. Uh, here we have a degree word, so it tells you how much. Quite fond, so very fond, not a little, but very. Uh, and then another common phrase is a prepositional phrase. The main word here is the head is the preposition in. OK, uh, we talked about this last semester in means that there is a physical space and that you are inside the space. So when it says in, the next question is in where? What kind of space? So the complement gives us more details. The space is a house. In the house. Is there a limitation? Yes, there is. Almost in the house. Not actually in the house. Almost. Um, so this explains the second half of the diagram we were looking at earlier. 
a map, never over eat, you can see that the kind of phrase is determined by the head. Specifier and head, this is the specifier, this is the head. The kind of word in the head determines the function of the entire phrase. Uh, so if we put them together, right? Um, sure, by car. How do you get from home to school? By car. The whole thing is a prepositional phrase. So the head is by. And the complement is car. The focus is on how. And the car is simply the details of the information. So if you put this into a complete sentence, this entire section is considered prepositional. It's not an object. It's not a subject. It's not a verb. It's extra information. Here, uh, in this verb phrase, the head is a verb, eat. The complement gives you extra, the more information. What are you eating? Candy, a noun. Uh, it, when you put this in a sentence, this whole part is the second half of the sentence. You only need a subject. Well, you also you also need like a time. We'll get to time later. Right, that's pretty self-explanatory. Ah, OK, so. Uh, this is the structure of preposition. Sorry, not for possessives. Because really what you're saying, if you say the child's bicycle, what you're really saying is the bicycle of the child. So uh, the structure is still as expected. Bicycle is higher than the prepositional phrase of the child. But in real English, we don't say that. We say the child's bicycle. So to reflect the fact that the, the head is the bicycle, uh, we write it higher than the child's, right? The point is the bicycle, not the child. Um, but because the order is the child's comes first, so we write it like this. Um, let's see if we can, no, these are all noun phrases. Uh, and if possessive works like this, then a possessive pronoun works the same way, right? This should be the car of him. But we don't say that. We say his car. So we put it on the left, but it's still lower than the head of this phrase. Okay, so now that we know the basic structure of a phrase, now we can look at... Um, what is this, move? Oh, merge, sorry, merge. Um, so in fact, often a phrase can take another phrase, right? So this noun phrase, the house, house is the head, the is the specifier telling you it's a specific house, and this whole thing is a noun phrase. The noun phrase can be the object of a prepositional phrase. So if you say in, in where? In the house. You're not just taking the words the and house. How do you express the idea that the and house are connected? You can't separate them. You express that idea by putting them together as a noun phrase. Uh, so that's what the merge operation is. Combine words in a manner compatible with the X-bar schema. Using this logic, how can you combine phrases into bigger phrases? Right, well, B actually contains the entirety of A as its complement. So this is a prepositional phrase, the head is a preposition, and the complement just gives us more information about the phrase. So this is why English sentences can be infinitely long. Uh, there was an example earlier that I skipped. Here, right? 
a book. Or yeah, a book, a book on the table, a book on the table near the bookcase, a book on the table near the bookcase in the office, a book on the table near the bookcase in the office on top of the building last night before the janitor came. The sentence can be infinitely long because when you add more to the sentence, you're simply adding more phrases to the right hand side of the tree diagram. You're using the merge operation again and again and again. So as long as the new phrase that you use as the complement can be the complement of your larger phrase, you can keep going forever and ever. We're going to see how you can add more words to the left hand side a bit later, but it's the same logic. Sentences can also be infinitely long on the other side. It's the right answer. I think it's the right answer. You know I think it's the right answer. Harry said, you know I think it's the right answer. The teacher said that Amy told him that Harry thought that uh, he said, you know I think it's the right answer. The grammar is correct, even if the meaning is confusing. Um, and really what this is doing is you're actually adding new phrases on top of the previous phrases. Um, and you're turning what used to be the main phrase into the complement of an even bigger phrase. Um, ad infinitum, you can keep on going. So this shows you how important the merge operation is in English sentence structure but the grammar has to be correct. Uh, and the way that the grammar is correct is um, by distribution, where, where to go? Uh, the basic idea that only some kinds of words can be added to other kinds of words. So this holds for individual words and it also holds for phrases. In fact, as the textbook kind of tells you, there are no individual words. Every individual word is a phrase. Uh, there was an example somewhere. Right here, she is itself a phrase. She is an the word she is a noun, and if used uh, alone in a sentence, then it becomes a noun phrase, even though it's only one word. Like uh, if we say uh, she liked him, then she would be the only part of the sentence before the verb, it would be on the left hand side of the sentence. There's only one word, so the whole thing, one word is the noun phrase. On the right hand side of the sentence, after the verb, the complement of the verb would also be a noun. There's only one noun, one word, him, so the word him is also itself an entire noun phrase. So when we look at sentence structure, there is no such thing as the individual word. Every word falls into somewhere in this tree diagram. Uh, and then here we have uh, some information about other languages. Uh, some other languages build their trees in the opposite direction. There are differences between languages. OK, then we get to the sentence. This is a complete sentence. The hikers found the shortcut. So we've been looking at this part. The shortcut is a noun phrase. The head is a shortcut, uh, and it's preceded by a determiner, an article, the shortcut, which tells us that it limits the kind of shortcut. Uh, this is actually an abbreviation. This should be shortcut n n bar np determiner np the shortcut is the noun phrase these two go together to form a single noun phrase this noun phrase is the complement of 
the verb found. So found, found what? Found a shortcut. And together they form a verb phrase. A similar logic is on the left, right? Hikers is the head. The limits the kind of hikers. And you put these two together, it forms a noun phrase. But it's not enough to just have a noun phrase and a verb phrase to form an English sentence. In English, every sentence has a tense, past or not past. Uh, in linguistics, we, we don't say present or future because in English, the future is actually two words, uh, will plus verb. Um, so if you only look at single verbs, uh, you have either it is past or it is not past. The word found is past, so you have to add that idea here somewhere. And so the way that this uh, theory of syntax adds the tense is to create a whole new phrase. This is called, uh, you can say it's called like the temporal phrase or the tense phrase. Uh, the head is a tense. The key idea is that it is in the past. What is in the past? This verb phrase happens in the past. And on the left, this is the specifier of the whole situation. It limits the situation. Somebody found a shortcut. Who found it? The hikers, nobody else. It's a limit. Um, so now we have the nouns, we have the verbs, and now we have the tense, past or not past. We're almost finished building a complete sentence. Here's the thing. Why is this not yet a complete sentence? It looks like a complete sentence, right? The hikers, subject, found, verb, the shortcut, object. Isn't that complete? Yes, this specific sentence is complete. But what if you need to add more things? What if you need to say the hikers did not find the shortcut? What if you need to ask a question? Did the hikers find the shortcut? Or even more worryingly, where did the hikers find the shortcut? How do we add these ideas into this structure? Well, you can't. You have to expand the structure. You have to add another level. Um, OK, so here we have an example of future. Will is future tense, so that is the head of this uh, T phrase. Uh, we just looked at this. Complement options, so again, these are specific words can take specific complements. Right, so like these words, you can only add these kinds of phrases. So for example, be, right? You can add an adjective phrase, be angry. Um, but you can't add a verb. You can't say uh, like uh, be eat. It has to be turned into an adjective, be eating. So like these are just some examples of how verbs limit the kind of complements that you can add after them. OK, and then you have things like uh, if you if you add a double complement, right? Open the door for a meet with a crowbar. It takes three complements. So how do you do that in the diagram? You just draw three different uh, sides on the right hand to add each individual phrase. Put the book on the shelf takes two. This head put takes two complements, the book and on a shelf. The book is, of course, a noun phrase. On a shelf, the head is on, so this is a prepositional phrase. And the whole thing forms a verb phrase because the key idea is the verb. Uh, here you have examples of noun complements. Some nouns can only take some complements. 
some examples of adjective complements. Some adjectives can only take some complements uh, as well. And some examples of prepositional complements. Um, you can also sometimes take a, a longer phrase or even a sentence as a complement. We're going to talk about this in week nine, uh, but the basic idea is here. So this is the complete sentence, right? The team won. One itself is only one word. It itself forms a verb phrase. The um, team, noun plus specifier, forms a noun phrase, and you put them together by adding the past tense. So we have seen this structure before already. Now it adds something new. CP, why is it called C? Complementizer, okay, that doesn't matter. Here we have the expanded structure. Once you add the C level, you can start doing more complicated things with English sentences. If you add the word that to the head position, this tells you that the whole thing should be the complement of an even bigger sentence. So for example, here, that we have just seen this, right? That the team past tense one. This entire part, this uh, complementizer phrase forms the complement to the verb phrase hope. Hope something, hope what? Hope that the whole, that the team won. This is the thing that you're hoping. And so you can continue to build the rest of the sentence. You have a verb, you have an object. You, now you can add a subject, the fans. You can again add, is this a past tense sentence? No, this is present tense, so this is non-past. And you can put together a new sentence, taking this sentence as a complement of the verb phrase. There is no limit on the number of embedded clauses. So like when Harry said, I think she thought we believed, etc., etc. What you're doing is you're adding new levels on the left hand side. You can keep adding and adding and adding and there's no limit. Um, so these are the kinds of words you can use that take an entire sentence as its complement. Um, these are the words that you can put in this position, uh, not this position. You could put in this position. These are the kinds of verbs. OK. The move operation. This is when you have to change the order of things in the sentence. For example, yes, no questions. Can we meet at the library? We know that the original sentence should be we can meet at the library. So how can we move one word? How does that work? Right, those guys should leave becomes should those guys leave? Well, uh, we use the same structure. This is the complete sentence, right? Those guys should leave. Leave is the verb phrase. Should tells us the tense, which is subjunctive. Those guys is the head, the subject. So this is a complete sentence. TP is a complete sentence. But if we move the word should to the front, we need a kind of structure to fit that word somewhere in the front. Uh, and so we can use the CP structure. And it looks like this from those guys should leave and now it goes should those guys leave um it is a question right in the original structure it already says it is a question uh, and so question is the head of this phrase 
T tells you the tense. So in English, whenever you form a question by moving a word to the front, this is what you are doing. Um, but it, it you can also do this if it's not a question, right? This is sim this is just like uh, that. Whether those guys should leave is not a question. So this space is already occupied. You cannot move the word should over. There is no place to put it. Right? If you move it out, you don't have a place to put it. It is already occupied by whether. Um, so this can help you decide whether a sentence is a question or is not a question. If you can move the word and you can put it somewhere, then it can be a question. But if the space is already occupied, then it is not a question. Uh, OK, those are yes, no questions. But what if you add a new idea? Um, let's begin with the word what. This is the simple one. Nouns, who and what are simple are simpler to do. The, the original structure is still the same. Uh, we don't see this. The original structure is Rada can speak which languages? Or they will talk about what? Why don't we have the original? Oh, there we go. Yeah, OK, so. Here. This is the original order of the sentence. Rada can speak which languages? Now we know that we want to make a question. So just like for a yes, no question, we move which. To this position. Oh, sorry, can sorry, we move can to this position. So from Rada can speak which languages, it becomes can Rada speak which languages. But it still doesn't make sense. Right, we have to make it begin with the question word. Well, fortunately, we have a new space here because we have added a new level, the C bar level. Previously. Previously. Not here. Here, previously we did not have a C bar level, right? Sim directly from C to C phrase. Um, so it's only one space for the yes, no question. But if you're asking a more complex question, you add in the C bar level. Here, this C bar level. So this space can take the original yes, no question word, can. But because you have an extra level, now you have an extra opening. And so that can take which languages? The thing that you're actually asking about. So from Rada can speak which languages? First, you move the can to form the question. Then you move the part you're asking about as a limit to the question. This is now the specifier. It is limiting your question. What are you asking about? You are asking about this thing. It specifies your question. That's why it's called a specifier. And this is the same for all the other questions. They will talk about what you move the what directly to uh, the empty space on the left of CP. Yeah, they will talk about first you move the will to the question side. Then you move the what to the beginning, so it looks like this. You move the will to the question and you move the specific information to the specifier. So they will talk about what becomes. What will they talk about? Why am I talking about all of this stuff? When you look at a correct sentence, it all makes sense. It's supposed to. It's supposed to explain a correct sentence. But if your sentence is incorrect, 
and you try to move these things around, you won't know where to put them because the structure of your sentence does not leave enough space for you to move things. So this can prevent things like um, when you make a relative clause and you you keep the word it. Like. Um, um, the stage that the school took. Some of you will say the stage that the school took it. But if you add the word it at the very end, then what you're doing is you're putting a new word in this space. Uh, and you're actually doubling. The elements. Of these locations. So if if you understand the structure of an English sentence formally, the rules of forming an English sentence, it can help you check whether your sentence is correct or not. Are there too many things? Are some things missing? Um, So you know, I really hope, I really wish that um, the textbook could give us some incorrect tree diagrams to show you what I mean. But uh, I guess 44 pages are not enough for that. Um, right. Oh yeah, this is a cool. This is a. This is from Chinese. Nima Right? You buy past what? Le means past. So what did you buy? So it tells us that in Chinese we don't have the that specific move operation for question. Um, so when we move things for questions, we're talking specifically about English. But even in English, some questions don't move to the front. Uh, and so th this box gives you some exceptions. Verb raising. OK, verb raising is, I think, not in English, in French, so we can skip that. OK, verb raising in English. Yeah, I think we can skip this. We can skip it because the sentence order remains the same. The students have finished the project. Uh, first you move here and then it moves to the front, but really we already know that it ends up in the front, right? Have the students finished the project. The internal movements we can skip. Additional structures. Modifiers. Oh, this is cool. So adjectives. Uh, I always tell my students when I'm like teaching an individual student, I tell them adjectives and adverbs are unimportant for the grammar. You can take away the adjectives, you can take away the adverbs, and the grammar will be the same. So this is how we see this in uh, a tree diagram. Same thing, right? The family is a noun phrase. This is the complement of the prepositional phrase of the family. Uh, and this is the complement of the noun phrase a friend of the family. But now there is a new adjective here, a good friend. Good itself is the only adjective, so it itself is the adjective phrase. But because it does not change the grammar of the sentence, we give it its own end bar level. Now you have two end bars. And this tells you that you can take away this part. And the structure of the sentence will be the same. Noun phrase, noun bar, uh, prepositional phrase as complement. So in this way, we can draw a tree diagram that shows how adjectives and adverbs are non-essential to the grammatical structure. Same thing for the adverb, right? 
if you now have a new adverb here, you just add another V bar. Uh, and if you take it away, then this becomes the V bar. If you don't have an adverb, then this becomes the V bar. Uh, sorry, if you take away this, this part, very carefully. If you take this away, the sentence structure remains complete. Verb phrase, verb bar, complement is a noun phrase. So adjectives and adverbs uh, don't change the grammar of a sentence. Relative clauses, guantai. I don't think we need to talk about this, right? Sometimes it has to move, right? So here, uh, this sentence is the friend Hadassa visited who? This is the original sentence. Hadassa visited somebody. And this somebody is the friend here. So how do you make this work? You move that somebody to the front. And that forms a relative. Yeah, we don't have to talk about this. Passive. The key idea is you can use this structure to make any English sentence. I, we've covered the, the basics. Oh, this is Welsh. Where is you? If you're interested. Uh, and then 555, five, five, if you want to, you can skip this part. This is a different theory. Um, in linguistics research, this theory is becoming more and more popular. So the textbook, just in case the professor believes in this theory instead of the other theory, the textbook gives you information so that the professor can teach it if they want to. I don't want to. So you can skip this. Uh, and then a summary. Uh, and then some extra explanations. How do you draw a tree structure? You can try this if you want. I think it's a lot of fun. You know, I do this when I'm bored. Um, how to use merge to build a sentence structure. How to use move. It's a step by step explanation. Things to remember and then you have practice questions. You can do these to practice if you want to. And that's it. 44 pages done. Uh, so that's the basic idea. Please go home and read this more carefully. Uh, and hopefully that will help you learn more about English sentence structures and help prepare you for the specific details that we will add each week. Questions? Sorry, questions that you know how to ask? Yeah, OK, so you have two weeks to try to make sense of that chapter. Uh, and then uh, the next time we meet, we will talk about subordinate clauses, starting from the easy stuff. Okay, that's it. See you next week.